Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Connor, and I'm the executive director of the Canadian Open Data Society. Uh, with me today, uh, I have uh, our board members, uh, Rachel Doucette, uh, Wilfried L. Edward Dolce, and Michael Schwanzer, uh, who are on the call just now. And uh, I'm going to allow people uh, time for what we call the digital commute. And uh, in the meantime, um, I will be doing a few slides. I'm just going to make sure I can let people in. Let's see. Here we go. Oh. Pretty good. All right. So uh, today I'm happy to have with us uh, Alia Kotub and uh, Farah Hawk from uh, Esri. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, they have a, a function called the Community Map of Canada, La Carte Communitaire du Canada. But before we begin, and again, to allow time for that digital commute, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about the society. Uh, oh, and first, <laughs> uh, our legal disclaimer, uh, everything here is uh, just taken on your individual responsibility alone and uh, feel free to ask questions uh, uh, now or in future. Uh, we are always available at admin at opendatasociety.ca or through our social media. Uh, but if you're making any, you know, dire decisions, uh, please consult professionals, uh, as I always say. Uh, so I will go on now to uh, introduce the society in concert with my colleague, uh, Rochelle. So our vision, uh, mission and value proposition uh, for the society, uh, we, we really want to have a global impact with a national uh, action plan. Uh, we want to have an effect, a positive effect on most people's lives through open data. Uh, through that uh, mission, uh, our main focus is bolstering members' individual capacity. I'm happy to say we're approaching uh, 100 members, including a number of uh, organizational members, each of which represent uh, a great number of people themselves. Um, and we want to broaden the discourse beyond government to the private sector, civil society, and the general public. And uh, we hope to facilitate a community of practice where best practices and tips and ideas and leads are traded in the open data community. Um, so we do the monthly webinars, we advocate for open data releases, we promote awareness of events and developments and jobs uh, sometimes in the open data space. And most of all, we have the Open Data Summit uh, every autumn. Uh, the last one was a, a barn burner. We had uh, 600 people show up two or three times as many as we expected. And uh, so we're quite looking forward to the autumn of 2022. Uh, Rochelle? Alors, notre vision, mission et nos valeurs euh, à, la, à la communauté canadienne et données ouvertes. Euh, notre vision de faire de Canada un modèle mondial d'une société véritablement ouverte. Euh, tout de suite, notre euh, nos, nos membres sont rendus à 100 membres, alors on est vraiment fiers de, de, de ça. Euh, notre mission, renforcer la capacité des membres à réaliser notre, notre vision, élargir le discours sur les données ouvertes au secteur privé, à la société civile et au public, euh, et aussi devenir une communauté de pratique qui fait progresser l'apprentissage, les normes et la qualité des données. Alors, la valeur pour nos membres, euh, comme déjà mentionné, on est rendu à 100. Euh, c'est de faire la sensibilisation aux événements et, et développement dans l'espace des données ouvertes, notamment notre sommet euh, qu'on fait à chaque année. Et puis, euh, l'an dernier, c'était virtuel euh, à l'automne et puis on avait au-dessus de 600 euh, participants. Alors, c'était vraiment un grand succès et on va continuer à élaborer là-dessus. Paul, oh, next. Merci. Um, all right, with that, uh, we will go on to the uh, presentation by Esri, and I will stop share of my screen. Alia, please uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, Farah is actually going to start first by sharing, uh, mm -hmm. talking about the Living Atlas. Um, so uh, we'll share, she'll uh, share her screen. Yes, uh, thank you. Ali and Paul, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my name's Farah Hawk, and I'm the Living Atlas Curator for Esri Canada. 
And today I'm gonna go over um, a free to use hidden gem of Esri's called the Living Atlas. Sorry, gonna... Sarah, are you sharing your screen yet? Am I not? I thought I was. No, not yet. Is it there now? Give it a minute, I guess. Okay. Are you sharing it? Um, you should hit the green button at the bottom middle of the of the Zoom screen, and uh, and then choose which one you want to share. There oh, we okay. go. There we go. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. So um, yeah, I'm I'm going to talk about the Living Atlas. Uh, it's a hidden gem of Esri's, and I'm going to go over um, what it is, how you can access its content, and use it to enhance your geospatial workflow and web applications. So the ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World was launched by Esri in 2015 as a celebration and appreciation of open geospatial data around the world. And um, by definition, it's a geospatial warehouse of ready to use authoritative and curated content, such as layers, maps, and apps on hundreds of topics. And the content uh, comes from various sources like uh, government organizations, federal and provincial, and some municipal ones as well, uh, non-for-profit and indigenous organizations, research data from universities, and um, also some content that is published by ESRI on behalf of um, organizations, usually governments um, from their open data portals. And so a majority of this content is open and it can be accessed by anyone without even making an ArcGIS online account. So how do you access all of the wonderful content um, in, the, in the Living Atlas? Well, the main way is by going on the main website, livingatlas.arcgis.com where you can browse through and uh, contribute content as well. So under browse, uh, there are seven main categories of content at the top, and you can get more information about each of them by hovering over. And uh, each of the content categories includes subtypes. And you can further filter your uh, content results down by filtering by the content type, when it was last updated, the region or country that the content is from. And you can also sort by the relevance, most recent um, popularity or view count uh, and the title. And lastly, you can also save a number of items uh, under my favorites so you can access them later. Now, if you do have a public um, ArcGIS Online account, you have the advantage of uh, pulling layers from the Living Atlas directly into your map viewer by uh, clicking on the add data button and going to browse Living Atlas layers. And if you have ArcGIS Pro, it's a very similar process. You would uh, navigate to the portal and click on this uh, book icon that is the Living Atlas. So as I mentioned, uh, there are seven main categories of content in the Living Atlas, and I'm going to go over the highlighted ones. First up is imagery. So on the left are some satellite imagery that are updated daily, such as Landsat and Sentinel-2. And on the right is uh, Canada's land cover map from 2015, which shows 15 different land classes that's uh, classified from Landsat imagery. And if you're interested in doing your own classification from images or even LIDAR point cloud data, you can take advantage of 
the variety of uh, deep learning packages that's offered in, in the Living Atlas to extract features like uh, building footprints, trees, power lines, and more. And last but not least, um, probably the most coolest and um, most popular item under imagery is the World Imagery Wayback App that allows you to compare the same image from two different uh, time periods using a swipe tool. Another cool feature on this app um, allows you to save a time lapse of a collection of imagery and save as an animated GIF. Next up is environment. Under environment, we have some emergency management apps uh, created by provincial organizations, such as this wildfire dashboard from the government of BC um, that shows active fire status and perimeters. And it is very critical during the wildfire season that happens in Canada from um, April to October. And at the bottom is this interactive minerals app from Alberta that shows industrial and metallic minerals overlaid on Alberta's uh, bedrock geology. Over here on the right is uh, Northwest Territories long-term change detection app that uh, highlights changes in the landscape caused by natural hazards and also urbanization. And at the bottom is some really cool research uh, done by a PhD student from, the, uh, from Laval University on uh, permafrost mapping in a village called Nunavik in Northern Quebec. So if you're an environment, environmentally uh, conscious person like I am, and you wanna know what's happening around the world, um, you can take advantage of the indicators of the planet page in, our, um, in, in the Living Atlas that uh, presents an almost real-time snapshot of um, mostly environmental metrics around the world that is created by leveraging uh, real-time data that is already in the Living Atlas. So you can get um, statistics on the air quality, earthquakes, cyclones, uh, global temperatures around the world. So while we're on the topic of live feeds, um, the Living Atlas actually includes a live feeds status page which reports on the status, uh, usage, traffic trends, and an RSS feed link for weather and other natural disasters around the world. And um, although this live feeds page contains mostly US live feeds, uh, there are also some global ones as well, like um, live stream gauges and fire activity. So as a data curator for um, Canadian content in the Living Atlas, I had the opportunity to create and automate uh, two Canadian live feeds on the left, um, such as this active wildfires in Canada that updates every three hours and uh, this electric charging stations, one that is updated daily. And they're both from um, NRCAN. And on the right are just some other uh, Canadian live feeds that you can also find in the Living Atlas. Let's go over infrastructure next. So on the left um, is the World Traffic Service, which is updated every five minutes and it shows uh, the traffic speed on roads as well as major accidents indicated by the red dots. 
And at the bottom is this um, amenities layer provided by OpenStreetMap that shows the location of retail, commercial, and uh, recreational facilities like restaurants, uh, parking lots, schools, and more, and is also updated every five minutes. And uh, this layer actually comes in very handy when I'm traveling to a new place and uh, trying to find some local food. Um, and lastly is this really cool uh, 3D web scene of downtown Montreal, which allows you to zoom and pan across the map. And it was created by uh, combining a terrain layer, imagery based map and a 3D uh, building layer. And there's also one for Vancouver as well. Also under infrastructure are these um, road networks um, and they cover entire provinces from local roads to highways from um, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and PEI. And there's also a national uh, Canada wide um, road network network layer as well that was added from the uh, government of Canada's open data portal. And on the right is an interactive uh, pipeline dashboard of Canada from the Canada Energy Regulator CER that shows um, any incidents that occurred near uh, regulated pipelines that were reported since uh, 2008. So under people, um, aside from a demographic and population related data, there's also some historical content, such as this uh, story map on the left on the role of Canadian women during World War I, uh, this in indigenous place names layer in Canada that shows uh, the names of streets, lakes, and rivers in Canada that originated from indigenous um, words. And I'm actually in the process of adding more indigenous content in the Living Atlas. So um, look out for those. And at the bottom is um, a map from BC that rates the quality, quality of uh, disabled parking spots in places like uh, grocery stores, um, malls, large uh, parking spots. And uh, lastly, on the right, a very topical item right now is this um, Regional Trends COVID-19 dashboard that Esri Canada maintains that shows the daily case counts, uh, number of recovered, number of deaths, and also the number of COVID tests administered. Uh, that was that is uh, compiled from all of the health units in Canada every day. And our COVID-19 uh, hub site also includes a national weekly trends map and data from uh, provincial health ministries as well. Under base maps, uh, there are a few creative base maps with uh, different cartographic styles that you can overlay your data on, such as uh, Nova, Blueprint, Pop Art, and more. And um, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening and feel free to reach out if you have any questions or would like to contribute your um, open data to the Living Atlas, my uh, contact information will be provided in the end. Now I'm going to pass it off to Alia, who's gonna go over a powerful set of uh, Canadian base maps that can also be found under the base maps category. Thank you. You're on mute, Alia. 
Of course, thanks, Farah. Um, as connoisseurs of open data, you all understand the importance of sharing the data with the public. Having an open data site can, you know, can it's easily navigated sometimes by, you know, the technical folks. Not necessary. Everybody can understand how to download, or they don't always need to download the data. So. I'm going to be talking to you about the community map of Canada because it's that visualization of public data that's you know uh, comes from authoritative sources. But before I do that, I wanted to start with this quote that we really like at Community Maps. It's data that is loved tends to survive, and and that's what's our aim. Um, what we do at Community Maps, we like to share data that's loved um, by the community. Um, so in my in my next 10 minutes with you, 15 minutes, I'll be walking through an overview, will be walking you through an overview of what the community map of Canada is, the type of layers you'd, you'd be able to see on the map uh, that can be used for by like, a larger audience, as well as what are the benefits, whether you are a user of the community map of Canada or an actual contributor. Um, and finally, I will close by a couple of examples of two of our contributors and how their open data sites look like. So the Community Map of Canada is a national base map program that's hosted by Esri Canada to create a standardized cartography of the country. Data that is on the Community Map of Canada comes from authoritative sources. What do we mean by that exactly? We work with communities um, who are the authority figure um, of the data in their area. So by that, we're talking about all levels of government, whether it's the federal, provincial, regional, or local governments. We are also working with First Nation communities. Uh, we're working with universities and colleges, as well as some infrastructural organizations, such as airports and ports authority. Again, they know their area very well. They maintain it. You know, what we do is just facilitate it by hosting it on the base map. And Place names are in, uh, in different languages. Again, it depends on the contributor. So you will, in certain areas, you will find English, you'll find French and, you know, indigenous place names as well on the map. And the best feature is it's complementary. You do not, again, you do not need to have um, an ArcGIS uh, license or, or an account to be able to view the map and explore the map. Um, Looking at some of the layers that you would be able to uh, see, again, it depends on the contributor and what the layers they have. They're in six main categories, administrative and political boundaries, culture and land use, cadastral, transportation, physical feature, and um, high resolution aerial imagery. All the five, you know, with the exception of imagery, everything goes into the community map of Canada. Imagery is actually processed and is sent to Esri Inc. for inclusion into the world uh, imagery uh, base, uh, base map, which is also available complementary for viewing. So what does it mean for you as a user of this map? What do you get? You can always trust the data because it comes from the sources, it comes from the owners. Esri Canada does not change the data. Um, we just host it for you. We, we field map it to the scheme, to the standard schema, and then we publish it out. The frequency of the update, that's a sort of a supremacy. I don't believe any base map out there um, has the same frequency of updates. Um, we have over 300 and something contributors. And what we do is we ping them nightly for any changes in their data. And then um, we publish a map every 72 hours, every three days, you know, a new version of the map comes out. And so with those two in mind, it increases your productivity and knowing that the base map is available, and then you layer on top of it your operational uh, layers and gives more oomph, if you will, or, or more power to your applications or story maps um, or um, visualization. We provide a 
part of you know the standard styles there's five standard styles that you can choose of and that gives you creativity or additional um, choice depending on the type of application and the need that you have so we've got topographic street street night light gray and dark gray you can also take the community map of canada and using the ezra esri vector style editor which is a free tool as well change it and customize these vector base maps into something of your own. Um, the base maps are also available in an offline mode. And most recently, we have made them available in an offline. Um, and there's workflows to, to, to actually help you um, use the offline mode in an um, on ArcGIS Online, as well as Enterprise, if you are an Esri customer. So again, we have that for you. You can take these maps off, you know, um, if you have field workers in a remote area. So for contributors, for the, the, the community that actually has the data, what does it really mean for them? Um, first thing of all, it saves them resources. A lot of the municipalities, for example, that we talk to are one person departments and maintaining a base map becomes, you know, an overload for them. So by, by sharing their data on this uh, base map or to the program helps them, you know, um, save time and resources. Again, it increases their productivity and it eliminates uh, duplication, um, which base map is more accurate and builds a consistency. Um, just to give you, um, and my slide is off here, <laughs> and it also prepares for NG911. It gives municipalities uh, uh, um, practice to ensure that they're ready for the new NG911 um, 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 regulations that are coming. And just an example here of one of our municipalities that actually shares to the community map of uh, Canada, um, Ville de l'Assomption in Quebec. You know, as you can see over here, they've got two applications that look very different. And it's just by using two different styles. The, the application on the top showcases, um, is it's um, created to support um, um, their local businesses during the pandemic, while the one on the bottom was created to promote um, outdoor activities and their trails. So again, they can they have that consistency without jeopardizing the foundational layer. So some more examples of uh, open data sites and and uh, the use and they're all they're also contributors of the community maps and I just noticed that all my examples are out of the La, La Belle Provence uh, Ville de uh, Sherbrooke. <laughs> so um, here's that sort of this is their um, open data site and here's an example of one of their infrastructural maps and you can actually go into the map and download the data right there. Another example is Ville de Longueuil. Um, they have, it's not just an open data site, but it's also created on, uh, it's a geo hub and you can have, you know, explore the um, carte inter interactive general, as well as get access to the open data layers. Um, I'm going to also close with a quote, bringing it all back is we're entering a new world in which data is more important than software. And that is the future, the, the more the quality of your data um, is sometimes it's kind of uh, irrelevant of the software that you're using. Farah and I are available uh, by email. If you have any more questions, we're also available on LinkedIn. You can always find us, reach out. Uh, we're always happy to answer any questions and be of help. And question. Thank you. Yes, I, I believe uh, we do have uh, at least one question from the audience, plus uh, one of mine. Uh, Lee, oh, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yes, um, can you, I guess you can hear me. My mic's uh, going on here. You're good. Okay. 
Uh, it was for uh, Faria, I believe. Um, hope I got the right person. Uh, the style okay. maps that you showed earlier, that was kind of cool. I wasn't really expecting that. It kind of reminds me of when I was playing with my phone, uh, different settings, filters. Which one's your favorite of the six that you showed or which <laughs> one you use the most at work? Hmm. Well, uh, because I'm an artsy person, I like, you know, lots of fun and colorful um, layouts. So I'd say I like the pop art more. I don't really use it in, in my work because it's, you know, it's more artsy and not really professional looking. But yeah, I'd say that one is my favorite pop art. I can maybe chime in. I know I, we use the community uh, map of Canada quite a bit and I use the light gray one quite a bit just because it's a very subdued sort of background color. But what you might not know is that Esri also puts out like style of the month. So every mm -hmm. month they do an a theme styles of the base map and a theme that came out I think probably last year is called the, just the community base map which is I use that one quite a bit actually um, so that's another one to to check out as well thanks um, Rochelle that's uh, <laughs> thanks for doing it yeah um, we we like to have a lot of fun uh, at community maps so our team takes turns in creating new styles I think our most viewed style that was uh, created was that of Star Wars last Star year. Wars. Oh my God, that was like uh, views and, and uses <laughs> was, like, you know, topping the charts for us. Mm. Yeah. Um, a question from Eugene, what is your favorite previously obscure data layer? And I think it's for either one of you. Wow. <laughs> Obscure data layer. I'm, I mean, trying to get sometimes for smaller communities, trying to get their building footprints layer is very difficult. They just don't have the capacity or the resources to be able to do that. So, you know, trying to engage with them. Um, again, I'm going to use my example of Ville de l'Assomption. I remember. Um, when David Richard was talking about wanting to join the community map of Canada, he didn't have building footprints. And, you know, he decided that he's going to get, uh, I think it was students or, you know, contract um, um, workers to, to actually, in combination with other Esri software, such as Survey123 and whatnot, go around and collect um points for him so he can actually build his building footprints um that one i find is is usually a little bit difficult okay uh Farrah, would you like to have a crack at that question uh, i can't think of any that uh, comes to mind but um usually the uh, data that is offered on um, open data portals they aren't as um, visually appealing. They just have the dots on the map and it's not, you know, rendered in a nice way. So I like to take the um, open data and, and, and kind of make it look more presentable. Mm -hmm. But again, any data is useful. So I wouldn't say I've <laughs> come across any obscure data. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, Lee has a question. Lee has his hand raised. Yes, hello again. Um, this is for either one of you. I just had a question. You mentioned earlier that often municipalities only have maybe one person, like the, the smaller ones. How does the reach out process work? Do they often contact you? Because I would imagine a lot may not be aware of the process. I do uh, outreach to a few, because I know Toronto would probably be aware, the major cities would be aware. So in terms of um, the outreach program, it's a combination really, Lee, of us reaching out to them, like we already know um, some municipalities, of course, they're major customers of ours. So we do, it's a combination of us reaching out or through uh, events where we talk about the community map of program, we do, they would kind of reach out to us. So it's a combination generally. Thank you. I, I actually, I'm 
I have a few questions. I wanted to let everyone else go first, but um, when you're getting these data sets uh, to populate the maps uh, from public providers or even nonprofit providers, uh, is it uh, by now an automatic process like through APIs or what have you? We actually have three ways, Paul, to, um, you know, have contribution methods, we call them, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the majority of our contributors are actually on that have open data sites, we would just plug into their open data site and um, every night ping them to see if they have any changes. The other two uh, methods are if the customer, you know, um, has ArcGIS online, we will have a shared, like a map package on a shared group in ArcGIS online. Um, and then if the customer is more of an enterprise, they have ArcGIS enterprise and, and they're more um, settled or not settled, but more advanced, we can actually do a direct kind of geodatabase to geodatabase connection uh, in a way. And all these are, are you know, um, the open data site and the direct geodatabase connections are kind of automated. Uh, with the shared group on ArcGIS Online, if there are changes, the administrator needs to just kind of overwrite um, the existing shared like uh, map package. And again, the, the connection isn't automated. Our repository would ping and see if any changes, we collect them nightly and um, twice a week, we would publish a brand new version of the map. Nice, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I saw a post on LinkedIn recently. Uh, someone uh, had overlaid um, one of the feature layers from Art from Esri, I'm assuming from ArcGIS Online, over top of his QGIS, right? So that got me thinking, oh, I wonder if uh, because it's public, even if you don't or you're not necessarily an Esri shop, uh, because the APIs are public, right? Like people can consume um, those APIs in other products. So you don't necessarily have to be an Esri shop to be able to consume uh, these features. So I'm assuming that the Community Map of Canada would be a similar thing. I'm seeing Farah nodding, so <laughs> I hope yes, you see I will um, add to that from the uh, Living Atlas perspective. So everything in Living Atlas, well, most things is open and um, it, it can be accessed to other um, open source geospatial software like QGIS. Uh, they can, in, in QGIS, you can import a layer. So any types of layers like tile layers, um, feature layers, you can just uh, take the URL and uh, copy and paste it in your um, add server option. However, um, if you have things like dashboards and web applications, you cannot um, import those. Obviously, you would have to either uh, go on the Living Atlas website or um, you have to have an ArcGIS Online account. So in order to view content from the Living Atlas, you can um, do that without an ArcGIS Online account. But um, if you'd like to nominate and uh, contribute an item, then you have to have an ArcGIS Online account and have that item in your um, account in order to nominate. Okay. That makes sense. Good. Um, another question. I've been hearing more and more lately about the use of algorithms and machine learning uh, upon uh, overhead imagery from satellites and so forth in order to generate uh, data like railway car counts or, or building footprints for that matter. I wonder if uh, Esri is uh, in that game. Yes. <laughs> I Do you want to take also it? Speak to that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, under my imagery um, slide, I mentioned that um, the Living Atlas offers some deep learning packages where um, you could leverage, you know, AI and um, geospatial analysis to ex extract features from satellite imagery. You can um, use your deep learning model to, you know, um, train and test your model to output, you know, the ex 
abstracted features like um, building footprints. And if you have um, lighter point cloud data, which gives you elevation, you can map out um, buildings and um, features on Earth. Thank you. It's really interesting. Oh, I probably got more questions. They're just not quite surfacing, you know? <laughs> well, Paul, you can always call us. You know how to reach us. <laughs> yeah. You got Thank you very much. Um, hmm. uh, oh, uh, working with, yes, uh, OpenStreetMap. I noticed that was a part of the uh, offering. Um, <laughs> I remember this from back in the day. That's the one that feeds into, for instance, MapQuest, right? Uh, and it's contributed by by everyone. And uh, so I guess it was a, a different deal, of course, than, than Google or Bing Maps or what have you. Um, do you take any steps to support such open source communities at uh, Esri uh, to make sure that, for instance, they're ingesting, you know, verified data and so forth, that they have proper processes and, and so on? We do yeah. have OpenStreetMap for Leaflet. So that is one of the layers that Esri supports um, and definitely is available as part of the uh, available base maps uh, on the, I am not quite sure, Farah, is it on the Living Atlas? I know it's part of ArcGIS Online. You would have the OpenStreetMaps for Leaflet on available. Yep, it uh, should be available to yep. in the Living Atlas. Yep. Well, I guess my question is like, since they're generating information uh, that is of use to you, that, uh, that sort of ties in with other stuff that you're doing, uh, do, you, do you reach further? Do you reach out to that community and, and work with them in any way? Um, at Esri Canada, I, I, I can't answer to that. Um, yeah. You know, we, we're working on the community map of Canada. Definitely, you know, for Esri Inc., it might, might be the case. I just don't oh. know that right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I can follow up later on. Yeah, that. for sure. Yeah. Interested because it can be, when it's a two way street, it can be very rewarding, right? And you have that extra assurance if you are working with uh, the community. It's like Wikipedia, they have their preferred mm -hmm. editors, right? And uh, knowing that process gives you a greater sense of trust in whatever's resident on the Wikipedia system. Yep, for sure. Um, okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for uh, coming today. Uh, that Thanks was for having us. <laughs> really interesting, uh, very potent, I might say, uh, even a uh, short uh, presentation that uh, is going to start. I'm um, it's going to start me thinking for a while. Uh, I, I learned uh, ArcMap back in 2007 uh, when I was a political campaign manager. Actually, <laughs> I was ingesting. Uh -huh. uh, census data to find out where the concentrations of older people who vote <laughs> were, <laughs> you know, just, just giving it a try, just playing with it. And uh, it's, it's just been onward and upward from there. So I'm really glad to uh, make your acquaintance, both of you, and look forward to uh, future, uh, future interactions. Uh, I will take a moment with our, you know, our few uh, listeners who have been able to stay for the whole thing. I got a few questions one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, oh, I can't stay, but you're going to record, you're recording this, right? We're going to be able to watch it later, right? So, you know, you know, the audience is there. They're just not there. Uh, they're time shifted, you might say. Uh, but I'll, I'll be uh, saying that we uh, we continue to uh, welcome new members to the society. It's a mere $5 a month or uh, uh $50 a month if you're an organization uh, like a private sector company. Uh, we're, we're in the process of revising that, so get in on the ground floor while you can. Uh, with that, uh, you gain uh, discounts and access to experts, and uh, the webinars are free, but uh, there's a lot of extra work that I can do as, as the executive director for you uh, as, as long as our administrative costs are covered. So uh, please visit our website at opendatasociety.ca or uh, Rochelle, what's the French one? Um, Communitaire. Communitaire. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I oh. looked it up because I kept saying society, but um, it's, it's community. community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> community. 
That was our original thought, but yes, we got told we couldn't use that. <laughs> all right, well, with that, I will bring these uh, proceedings to a close and uh, look forward to seeing you all uh, at the uh, next uh, webinar, which will be the last Thursday in February, again, at noon Eastern time. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.